Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're thrilled to have you with us this morning um, as we continue with the future of immigrants in Los Angeles. We're very excited about this discussion. We're just going to have folks sign in and we'll get started in just a few moments. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Aria Summers Landsberger, she, her. I'm a philanthropic advisor, and I'm thrilled to be moderating this panel this morning with friends and colleagues. Um, we're so excited to have you all with us this morning. We encourage you to please use the chat. You can introduce yourselves, you can post your questions, your ideas. We really want you all to feel engaged with our conversation today. I want to jump right in because we have a short window of time together and we have an amazing panel of, of speakers. And I'd actually like to start off with Lindsay Toslowski of the Immigrant Defenders Law Center. Good morning, Lindsay. It's great to see you. Good morning. And, <laughs> um, I, I'd like to sort of kick us off with some context setting. And, you know, I think so many people have read the headlines around unaccompanied children and asylum seekers arriving in the United States and seeking protection. And it'd be great if you could give us a, a on the ground context. What, what do you think led to the increased number of those who appear to be arriving here in the US and how is it different from the past? Sure, well, thanks for having me. Um, happy to explain a little bit about the context that we're seeing because there's been a lot of you know, news stories out there that that don't give you the entire picture. And I think what, you know, there's just some fundamental things that are important to note. Um, we are seeing an unprecedented number of unaccompanied children at our border, in government custody, in border patrol custody right now. Um, but the overall pattern of migration that we're seeing is part of an annual pattern that we see every single year. Every year in um, March, April, May, we see a large increase in the number of children. But what has been unprecedented this year is the fact that, you know, after four years of a real dismantling of the asylum system and a dismantling of the protection system that accepts children, um, alongside policies like Title 42, which essentially closed our borders um, for most of 2020 um, and made it so that children who came seeking protection were actually sent back into Mexico or um, sent back to their home countries on planes. Because of that, um, we had a real pent up demand for protection in northern Mexico. And so the number of children who we saw crossing, many of them had been in stuck in northern Mexico for, you know, almost a year. Some of them had been um, expelled back to uh, Mexico and were crossing a second time. Also because many family units recognize that because of the ongoing implementation of Trump era policies like Title 42, which continues to this day, that they were unable to seek protection as a family. And so unfortunately, many of them had to make the heart wrenching decision to send their children ahead to safety. Um, you know, all of this combined with root causes, which I'm sure Odelia and other um, panelists will speak about later in this um, in this panel, because of the root causes that have sent uh, people fleeing from Central America for many years, um, and because of the pandemic, um, and because of government policies, <clears throat> excuse me, at the border, and over the last four years, we've really seen an unprecedented number of kids. And so currently, there are more than 17,000 um, children nearing 18,000 in government custody. And here in California, we expect that over the next year, we could see as many as 18,000 children leaving government custody custody and, you know, making permanent homes as asylum seekers and new residents here in the state. 
So it is an unprecedented number, but it's really a convergence of all of those factors, um, policy, the pandemic, um, and root causes that has led to um, you know, an unprecedented annual increase um, that mirrors some of the migratory patterns we've seen over the last 10 years. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for that really important context. Um, I think what I'd, I'd like to do is, is move us into how are we responding um, as a community? And I'd like to get us started um, with Dan, Daniel Sharp, who's joining us from the LA County Office of Immigrant Affairs. Um, it'd be great to hear from your perspective, how are local governments responding um, to this increase that Lindsay um, has so thoughtfully provided us the context for? Yeah, thanks, Aria, appreciate that. So. We're really looking at this uh, from a couple perspectives. One, in terms of just short-term crisis response to the, the surge that we've seen. And then we're also thinking long-term. So in keeping with Lindsay's point about the cyclical nature of this surge in, ch in children coming into our community, uh, we are aware um, that this is not just a one moment in time situation. And we do need to begin to be thinking about uh, sy having systems in place for ensuring the long-term successful integration of children in our community. So I think uh, at least from the LA County perspective, um, like many community-based organizations had a decision to make about whether to oppose, um, the presence of an emergency intake site in their community or not. Um, the county really had a similar process in terms of deciding to engage or not in the provision of services um, at the, the site in Pomona. And we did decide um, as a county to provide a number of services, um, at least initially at the site. And that includes providing health services, health screenings and vaccinations, um, mental health services. And then our Department of Children and Family Services, um, at least initially has been supporting the family reunification efforts um, in the Pomona emergency intake sites um, as the uh, provider, the contracted provider staffs up in order to um, be able to do that um, on a sort of more more ongoing basis. Um, so that was the decision that that the county made that we're going to make the best of a difficult situation, provide those services directly, um, and then be supportive um, to to have um, the most appropriate environment for um, for children um, in a very difficult. Uh, circumstance. Obviously, homes are the most appropriate environment, but um, this is not a situation where it's either um, the ideal setting um, or what we have. And and so I think I then want to probably pass it to, to my colleague, Nora Preciado. Our offices have been working together on um, convening a regional response to look at the post-release services um, that we need to be providing um, both as government and then our, our community partners in order to make the integration in the community as successful and po as possible. And that is really our focus. So I think maybe I'll hand it to Nora um, to make a few comments on, uh, on, on that as well about what our offices have been doing together. Thank you, Dan, um, and good morning, everybody. Um, on behalf of Mayor Garcetti and his Office of Immigrant Affairs, Nora Preciado, his director of his Office of Immigrant Affairs, thank you for the invitation to be a part of this really important conversation. Um, our mission uh, here in the office is to promote and advance the economic, cultural, social, and political well-being of all Angelenos, uh, including our immigrant and refugee communities. And um, this work re uh, requires that we work very strategically and collaboratively with many of you, including with Dan and, and our colleagues at the County Office of Immigrant Affairs uh, to ensure that we're being responsive to the needs. And right now there is no bigger current need than having to um, come up with a strategy to support and ensure a welcome with dignity for all the unaccompanied children um, that will be reunified with family here in LA. Um, as Jan mentioned, 
he talks a little bit about the um, the response, uh, immediate response. Uh, but in terms of the post reunification response, um, we took a model that had been implemented in 2018 during the family separation crisis, um, where uh, we convened a regional response. Uh, this was led by Mayor Garcetti and County Board of Supervisors, Supervisor Hilda Solis. Um, then and now, uh, we're working in close partnership with the LA County Office of Immigrant Affairs um, and many of you. Um, so this work wouldn't be possible without any of you. One of the first steps to this regional response had to be uh, a needs assessment, a serious needs assessment. Um, that included being very proactive, both county and city, in reaching out to our local CBOs and legal services providers to learn more about what they were already seeing, uh, what needs they anticipated for this population, uh, what needs they anticipated internally at the organizational level, and what could we do to be most helpful to their work as um, government entities. Um, this was really helpful in um, doing the initial needs assessment and identifying gaps of what was needed, but also in getting their very honest input into the role of city and county and philanthropy, another very important partner um, uh, WineGuard, um, CCF, uh, and many others who are involved um, in, in this effort. This assessment also took place internally, uh, both at the city uh, and county. Um, we talked to agencies and departments to check in, um, especially those that may be involved or are involved in providing support services to the children and their families to learn what was available, what is their capacity at the moment, uh, what are some of the gaps, how do we connect people to services more effectively um, and how to fold them into this regional response as well. Here at the city, we, for example, touch base with the shelter system, with our family source centers um, and others. Um, and I know the county did the same with um, many agencies involved in the response, like DCFS, health department, et cetera. The list uh, of anticipated needs that came out from that, uh, it's not, not gonna be um, surprising to many of you, but it included the need for legal orientations for parents and sponsors, um, information about how to access benefits, healthcare, mental health care, food, nutrition, housing, school enrollment and support, um, including uh, recreational programs, you know, camps, clubs, um, English language acquisition, and how do we support that, accessing legal services, um, obviously, um, at-risk uh, youth programs as well. Many of, of the children um, are teenagers, um, and so thinking about, you know, foster youth services as well, and case management, navigation support to connect to all of those services, um, as well well as making sure that we were um, providing services in language, particularly, and I know Odilia will touch on this, but indigenous languages. Um, and one other thing that I think uh, we've been uh, looking into is uh, providing opportunities for professional development for providers that include, you know, trauma-informed interventions, cultural sensitivity, and all of those things. Some of the gaps identified, um, just again, um, as we all know, there aren't enough case managers or navigators at the moment. Um, and, and when there are some of the populations served, they're limited, um, not enough, right? Indigenous language capacity, um, more um, a need for a more centralized school enrollment process, um, difficulties for this population, qualifying for housing support, uh, more connections needed for at-risk uh, youth uh, groups, um, streamlining uh, of legal services and providing continuity of those services. And um, again, uh, making sure that all our CBOs uh, have the knowledge of what's available for these families, not just those that traditionally work with um, these migrants. We. As part of the response, um, just quickly, we had a convening, um, uh, two convenings now, um, and the goal was to really just increase uh, communication among stakeholders. Um, it included about 60 CBOs, um, legal service providers, philanthropy, uh, county, um, city departments, law school clinics, faith groups, shelters, um, and others. And it was really just to provide information on what resources are available at the moment and the best way to connect, as well as loop again our philanthropy partners into this. So um, from that, there are some next steps that we're looking forward to. Um, and again, uh, the goal is continued uh, communication and collaboration so that we're not duplicating efforts and that we're taking advantage of the vast wealth of resources that we have here, but also doing our best to support those gaps. So that's a little bit of the regional respo response uh, post uh, reunification.
Thank you so much, Nora, for and, and Dan, for that really comprehensive perspective on how the city and county are approaching um, how to best support unaccompanied children arriving um, to the LA region. And um, as you noted, the community does have um, quite, a de quite a depth of expertise um, in this space. So I'd love to take us back to our community-based leaders. And Odilia, I'd like to start with you on what is your perspective um, and assessment of the current response um, whether it be at the federal, state, or local levels, and um, and the NGO um, response as well, and what are some of the changes you might recommend um, for unaccompanied children and their families? Uh, good morning. Well, good uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, well, it, it, it's a challenge for us because uh, the the biggest challenge we face as Indigenous people is the fact that we're not recognized as indigenous people, right? We are putting to the label of a Latinx. And that label is uh, very dangerous for us because as that label is broad, people automatically assume that everybody that comes from Guatemala, uh, from Nicaragua or from Mexico speaks Spanish. And, that, and people um, do not know or don't have the information that in Mexico, there's 68 indigenous language families and 364 languages spoken in Mexico alone. And Guatemala has over 23 languages along with its variants, right? So there's, and we did an, uh, an assessment as indigenous people with, with CLO. And we have this beautiful map that illustrates that there's 21 indigenous languages spoken in LA County. And we need to, um, uh, and we need one of the things that we recommend is the education of the institutions from LAUSD to the police department, um, to Department of Children and Social Services, about the language diversity and about the existence of indigenous people. Because when they don't know, then our rights get violated. Um, I ran into a woman at the clinic that we had in MacArthur Park this weekend, and she's like, I'm an interpreter. She was really excited because she doesn't come from an ill intent. She said, but the paisana, you know, she doesn't listen. She doesn't want to go to the classes. And when she goes, she comes back and she doesn't participate. So the kids have been removed and I tell her, well, that's on you because you did not participate in the classes. So now they're not going to give you your kids for about two years. I almost had a heart attack because as an interpreter, we're supposed to relate the message. We have no comment and we're not there to judge if she's a good parent, if she didn't take a good class, if she took the parenting classes or not. But if she took the class and there was, it wasn't in her language, she wasn't going to follow the instructions given in the class, right? If that information wasn't given and then the interpreter tells her, hey, this is your fault because you didn't pay attention in the class, but you can, even if you paid attention, you didn't understand. So these are the things that are happening that is also pushing our children to be removed from their parents. And um, so my recommendation is that we continue to educate ourselves about indigenous displacement the roots of, uh, of migration. And I think a very clear example of that is uh, VP um, Kamala Harris message to Guatemalans, do not come, right? But then she goes to Mexico and says, I'm gonna finance the Tren Maya. Well, you're telling us uh, are, are not to come, but then you're gonna find, uh, uh, the US is going to finance the Tren Maya who's already pushing out people who many lives have been lost defending indigenous lands and territories. You're militarizing Southern Mexico, border of Guatemala. Where are we going to go? I mean, we need to leave. We cannot stay there. The Tren Maya is gonna be the largest causes of displacement of the Mayan Yucatecan. So next year, Lindsay is gonna be dealing with indigenous people from Yucatan. Oh, it'll probably begin this year because uh, I mean, there's already a lot of uh, death of the land defenders in in what we call Mesoamerica, in Oaxaca, in Guerrero, in Chiapas, in Yucatan, and then we go to Guatemala, right? So I, I think uh, for us here in LA County, it's really important and um, to educate 
about the roots of migration of indigenous people and how do we service them through all these different institutions. We had um, the language cards with LAPD um, that along with Nora got passed right before the pandemic. I go back to the station and I ask the officer, so where's your card? How many times have you used it? None of them were carrying it. So the minute we stop pushing, they don't use it. So now we have to go back to scare one post pandemic, say LAPD, you need to use that card, you know, and those cards should be carried by every institution from uh, public defenders to, um, um, what are, uh, to the D Department of Social Services, to LAUSD, to every single institution that there is that will service these uh, children and families to make that effort. It takes one person to make um, th these change, right? And the other things that we face as a small, we're the only uh, human rights organization here in LA County. And it, it's been very challenging to be supportive of Lindsay's work or because there's so many restrictions to be able to go to these places to provide interpreting services. You know, um, we had insurances and then they requested us to have a bigger insurance and a larger insurance and those pennies at adds up. And when you're so small, you don't have that. So with us, it's just, there's so many challenges, but I think we found really great allies with Lindsay, with Nora, Aria, who helps us with the fundraising, and Daniel has been really key to service Indigenous people. So far, we've distributed over $2 million in Indigenous uh, communities here in, the, um, in LA County uh, with cash uh, support, $1.8 million uh, in uh, food vouchers, and then we have our food pantry that has been very successful. We've fed, we've had uh, given 44,000 meals in our communities, but that's a, we're a small team. We're only 12 and we hope to keep on being 12 for the next few years, you know, but hopefully we'll grow. But, you know, um, philanthropy plays a big role. This is the first time that we get support we've been doing this year for 20 years but the p positive thing about the pandemic is they notice our existence and we have some funding to employ 12 people and we hope to continue being the 12 or increase right so i think those are my two my two cents today thank you so much odilia um for anyone who knows me this is um the elevation and creating visibility for the leadership of Odilia and her team and others across the country has been really um, critical. And you know, I encourage you all to reach out to Odilia to learn more about their language justice models and youth engagement. It's really quite incredible. Um, and it's a great segue to Lindsay's leadership in the space, um, nationally recognized for her work and, and Lindsay, it's a similar question to you from your perspective. And what is your assessment of the current responses to unaccompanied children arriving in the region? And what changes would you recommend? Yeah, well, um, thank you, Odelia, for all of all of your remarks. And I think, you know, one of the things that is so important for immigrant defenders, and I think, you know, something that we want to continue to to push forward with all of our partners is the importance of recognizing indigenous communities, particularly with unaccompanied children and making sure that um, they are not invisibilized, that they are um, you know, treated with respect and respect means have access to services in their language. So um, just want to, to thank you for your words and to recognize that that is a gap and it's something that we're committed to partnering with you and Cielo on to, to make sure that we continue to fight back against that um, and to guarantee access to language justice for our communities. Um, that being said, you know, there are lots of gaps um, when we're dealing with the numbers that we expect to see. Um, even before the pandemic, before this latest increase in unaccompanied children coming to Los Angeles County and beyond, um, we, on any given day, you could go into a courtroom in downtown Los Angeles and see little children appearing before a judge with a trained government prosecutor, um, trying to have them deported um, with them 
unable to speak English, um, some indigenous language speakers, um, sometimes literally on their own and so little their feet don't even touch the floor when they're sitting in front of the judge. Um, and those children, um, even before all of this, were expected to represent themselves. We have never had universal representation for all children facing immigration court. Um, we don't have that nationwide and we don't have it here in Los Angeles. So on any given day when there is a docket of children appearing before an immigration judge, we have children who are going to fight on their own. Um, and I think, you know, Odelia was talking about some of the root causes for indigenous communities. Um, we also have, you know, other violence and natural disasters that children are fleeing um, in Central America, gang violence, cartel violence. Um, and for those kids, when they walk into an immigration courtroom and they are seeking asylum, the, the stakes are essentially a death penalty case. If they lose their case, they could be sent back to a place where they could lose their life. And they're not being given in courtrooms in downtown Los Angeles a lawyer to help them win. If they have a lawyer by their side, they are 1100% more likely to win their case. So the stakes couldn't be higher. So, you know, there's definitely a, a need for more attorneys, for more government funded representation at the federal, local, and state level um, to make sure that we don't have a due process crisis continuing. Um, and that, you know, government funded representation is important. It's also important for us to see that representation um, coming or that funding coming from other sources as well, because um, even when we have government funded representation, often times it doesn't cover all of the ancillary services that are required to truly meet the needs of this population. That could be indigenous language interpretation. That could be um, also things like case management services, linking our clients to other resources in the community. Um, we have so many resources here in LA County that um, can be utilized through these families, but there is a perpetual need to make sure that we are actually making that linkage. Right now, we have hundreds of kids who are in Long Beach and Pomona. Um, we actually work in 12 other sites throughout Southern California that house children in government custody. And when they are in government custody, they are given access not to full representation, but at least access to speak with MDEF attorneys. Um, they are given mental health services. They are given educational services, medical services. But when they leave government custody, all of that um, is no longer available to them unless we link them up with community resources. So the real, you know, lack or gap that we see in LA County is us, you know, making sure that we capture kids who are leaving government custody and link them both to attorneys, case management, and community resources. And I think there are some creative ideas that we have, you know, this group here on the call have been brainstorming together, including creating an attorney of the day program um, that would, even if they can't do full representation for every child, at least be there to help children in the moment at immigration court and potentially send them to essentially an outtake center um, where kids could get additional information and be linked to our community resources. So I'll stop there, but I think that there's um, lots of creative ideas for how we can make this work. And the great thing is here in LA County, I think that there is the political will and the community resources for us to really make a difference. Thank you so much, Lindsay. A very powerful statistic around how representation just really cannot be underscored 1100%. Um, I mean, that is extraordinary in terms of what difference it makes to have a, a person in the courtroom with the child to represent and advocate for them. And I think, um, you know, one of the questions in the chat um, actually brings us back to you, Odilia. There's a question specifically about the cards that you referenced. And how can community-based organizations and others um, get access to those? Well, well um, yeah, you could definitely. We're going to redo the cards because these were done in partnership with LAPD and uh, the Office of Immigrant Affairs. But at that time, we hadn't done an assessment. And now there's 21 indigenous languages uh, that needs to be included in that, in that card. So uh, if you could just uh, send me an email and... Um, 
odiliar at mycielo.org. And then we'll make sure when we reprint them very soon, um, we are going to share them with you all. We're excited. We're going to la launch um, our map on the 22nd of July uh, uh, our, uh, with our findings and also our Center for Indigenous Language and Power. And the cards will be distributed through that um, department. So we're really excited about that. And they're all with English phonetics. So you could ask, do you speak habla usted zapoteco? You know, it'll be fun. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's all with English phonetics. So <laughs> more than glad to share. That sounds great, Odilia. Thank you for that. And we'll definitely share contact information for those who are interested who don't have contact information for folks um, on the call today. And Lindsay, just to confirm, can you um, restate that percentage? I want to make sure we got it correctly on the difference that an attorney makes in the courtroom. Yeah, so if if a, someone face, facing deportation has a lawyer fighting by their side, um, a statistic that was gathered by the Vera Institute of Justice showed that they are 1100% more likely to access immigration relief, meaning get protection, win their asylum case, or some other form of relief, um, and be able to stay safely in the United States if they have a lawyer by their side. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, so I think you know, Lindsay, you brought us into a space of the creative solutions making. I think, um, you know, a lot of community members, philanthropists, um, you know, activists listen to these stories and wonder, what can I do? What are the solutions that I could plug into? What can I do as a community leader or, you know, engaged in this space? Um, that is accessible? What are some of those creative solutions? So I'd actually love to do a round with each of you. If you can share a little bit of how you think those that are on our call today can connect, can be engaged with you all in solutions making, in making this um, not seem like a problem, but an opportunity for community engagement and support. Um, so um, I see you nodding your head, Lindsay. So maybe I'll start off with you and then we'll um, move to each of you. Um, you know, we'll go to Nora, then Odilia, and then we'll close out with Dan. Great. Well, I do think that this is a, a huge opportunity um, for us to look at new models of how we can best serve these kids. So I, I mentioned, you know, some of the ideas around creating outtake centers that really harness the community resources. But I, you know, actually want to focus on something a lot more simple um, in sort of this last round robin um, discussion, because one of the things that I think is so important is for kids who are coming and new community members to feel connected to our communities. And so what I would suggest is that, you know, we oftentimes will seek volunteers um, to do things like work with kids who are applying for college, who've been here for a couple of years. We also seek volunteers just to drive kids to immigration court or to make sure that they get to their asylum hearing. Um, there are some, you know, really incredible organizations out there. Um, Cheerla is one of them that is working um, to have volunteers helping um, parents to fill out the information um, so that they can be reunified with their kids who are in government custody. There are other organizations like This Is About Humanity based in West LA um, and Every Last One that are helping to make these human connections between um, folks, young people who are new to our communities um, and our neighbors. And so I think, you know, one thing that we can all really simply do is really reach out and make human connections um, and provide assistance because you know, one of the things that we talk to the kids about in our Know Your Rights presentation is what happens if you don't go to court? Um, well, the truth is what happens if a child doesn't make it to court is that they're ordered removed, they're ordered deported in their absence. And so just offering a ride to an unaccompanied minor to help them get to court could actually save their life. It could help them get the protection they need. Um, so, you know, we always are are looking for volunteers who can do things like even bring kids to the airport um, who turn 18 in custody. All of these little things add up and they truly show the welcoming um, nature of Los Angeles and really help to um, do what I heard Nora welcome or mention earlier, which is welcome with dignity. And that's what we want to do. And that human connection is so important.
Hi, Aria. I think you call me second. Um, thank you, Lindsay. Um, I think I, I echo um, uh, what Lindsay was mentioning. Um, we have, we are lucky enough that here in the city of LA and the county of LA, we have an incredible number of organizations, um, partners that are working uh, with these families and these children, um, and they're always looking for whether it's volunteer or donations. So please plug in. Um, you can also plug in through our office. Uh, we will uh, direct you. And I think one of the the opportunities here is. Um, uh, and we know that everyone is working on many issues and that, that folks are um, doing the best that they can to make sure that we're responding in a way that, that is um, effective um, and helpful. Um, but I, I, I encourage you to stay engaged. Uh, I know that Dan and I keep knocking at your doors um, a lot, uh, but continue to stay engaged because I think that that constant communication, um, the strategizing together and collaborating with uh, the county, with the city, with the state and with uh, federal actors on all of this. Um, it's helping us think through not just the immediate response, but what are we doing uh, to address um, these needs that will continue to be there past this crisis, right? Um, Midterm, uh, long-term, um, we've already identified um, and we know what some of the gaps are, what some of the, the systems and structures that we need to either augment uh, or create, or as Lindsay was talking about, um, reimagine in this context. Um, it, I think it's an opportunity for um, everyone to stay engaged and to really contribute um, uh, to that thinking um, because I, I, I do believe that um, as we're ready to get in ready to make some um, recommendations and highlight some of those needs, some of those gaps, some of those things that we could um, potentially uh, innovate here in LA in this response uh, with philanthropy, with uh, state, city governments, uh, with federal government, um, it's important for all of you to continue to stay um, engaged in this work with us um, and to continue that partnership. Odilia, if you could uh, weigh in, we'd love that. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, well, I I think um, uh, one of the supports that we could offer for CLO for or like the legal organization is that we have a network of 200 interpreters that you have access to. We have an app you know, and anyone could access it. We could talk more, you could reach out to us and we'll give you the access to the app. You know, I, I know some of the organizations do not have the funding. And for us, it's more important the human rights because like Lindsay said, you know, you increase your uh, chances uh, at 11%, uh, 1100%, but it also increases more if you have a person that interprets in your language too, right? That understand what is an asylum, what is like, uh, you know, credible fear, all these vocabulary that is used that is unknown to our world. You know, it's where we're always talking about two different worldviews. And in order to, for us to connect those two worldviews, it's very important to have an interpreter to increase, you know, uh, the survival of these, ch these children wherever they are. So um, I think uh, we could commit with creating the cards, accessing to our interpreters and our cultural awareness trainings. Uh, we have multiple awareness training from Roots of Migration on how to identify the languages. So we are uh, definitely encouraging LA County uh, and, and uh, LA County people and organizations to partner in this because there is a large percentage of indigenous children. Um, the Department of Homeland Security just um, uh, sent out their uh, recent um, if a, a you know report and there is no mention of us as indigenous uh, people in that report. So I think LA could be uh, making history by us continuing to doing the language access, uh, educating and creating a model that could be repeated nationwide because migration is not going to stop. Indigenous people are going to continue migrating from South America, Central America to Mexico because of our natural resources. We are the last people that hold natural resources and the multinational corporations want them. In the case of water, Mexico has plenty of water. We have no access to water in Mexico because they belong to multinational corporations. So I think this is not the end of migration. It will not end the displacement of indigenous people will increase in the next years. So I think we could create a, a, a model movement here that could hopefully will be replicated in other areas. And I'll jump in right here. 
So um, I've posted, so I've shared some links with CCF that hopefully they can post into the chat because I'm not able to right now um, for folks that want to provide um, monetary or in-kind uh, donation support to children um, in the Pomona Fairplex or the Long Beach Convention Center. Ultimately, we're looking at a much larger number of children coming into the community from other locations um, around the country um, than we are just from Long Beach and um, and Pomona. So we're looking at a number of steps to be able to address a lot of the needs that folks have lifted up in the past uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, in the short term, we're looking at uh, potentially some welcome day events that coincide with going back to school um, where children and their sponsors can receive both legal orientation and then access to really important social service and academic enrichment support to make sure that they're on the path to success. We'll be reaching out to folks, um, probably a lot of you um, viewing the presentation to make sure that that is as um, complete and um, effective of an engagement um, as possible with children that have come out of the two sites here and that are coming into the community from, from elsewhere. And then ultimately, we, we do have the goal of really not having that be a one-off um, an event here or there, but really institutionalizing the concept of a welcome center, whether that's in a, as a physical location or otherwise, um, but to lay down the marker that we understand, um, that we have heard the message that uh, this is not a one-off situation, that we are a welcoming community and that the households that these children are coming into um, have been a part of our community for um, years, in some cases, many, many decades. And so um, those are some of the longer term goals that we have, both sort of institutionalizing our welcoming approach and then really building a system um, so that everyone seeking to provide support to um, children and their households um, are, are able to, so that the, the social and legal service providers are able to connect their clients um, to all available resources um, and support that that people need. And, and I will say, just to end on a positive note, we did see some years ago in 2014 when there was a surge of unaccompanied children in a number of communities around the country, um, there were sites where children were um, sheltered, where there was protest, there was um, community backlash and protests, and we've really seen the opposite here. And I think that bodes very well for the years to come that the community has come together. We've seen an outpouring, we've gotten lots of phone calls in our office and emails. And we know that the Fairplex and Long Beach have as well, and Lindsay's organization um, of individuals in the community and organizations that haven't traditionally worked with unaccompanied children, um, but that saw what was happening and wanted to help. And so our goal is to channel that and um, make this difficult transition and integration into our community as effective as possible. Um, so I think I'll, I'll end there. Thank you so much. Um, we're tracking questions in the chat and just want to uplift, you know, this, um, some of the key points around accompaniment, there's opportunities for that. Um, really for those who are on the line, if this is um, you know, something you're first learning about or hearing about in terms of indigenous language resources and access, um, you know, please do reach out. I think all of us are on a learning journey in that space. And it's fine if you just discovered it and realize like I may be a community-based leader and I haven't really integrated this into my work. And I'll, I'll say that working with Odilia and Lindsay, you know, they both really know how to bring this into the work. So there are lots of ways to learn and integrate this um, into your um, work that you're doing in community. Um, and obviously the connections with the city and the county. Um, I think in these final moments, um, you know, I think the message of welcome has been really key. I think the the one thing I would love, you know, we have still a few minutes left, um, is around, I think LA is unique in that you all have worked collaboratively across sectors. Um, and, you know, that means engagement with school leaders, um, educational, like the school districts, 
um, with housing departments, with a full, you know, full spectrum, as has been referenced in the call. And I think one other point is, you know, while we are, um, you know, definitely focused on unaccompanied children here, I think all of us would agree that we're really also talking about families and that sponsors um, of these children are often themselves also in need of support. Some of them are also survivors of trauma and need um, holistic support. So even if you don't work directly with children, um, but you work with families, I think that's important to keep in context. And I'd welcome anyone else to weigh in on that um, before we close as we have a few minutes um, to share some additional remarks. Oh, Lindsay, could you unmute? There you are, okay. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a, a really great point. And I think, you know, one of the things to note is that oftentimes, um, even though we don't have uh, universal representation, even for children in LA County, um, finding representation for families is even more difficult. There are less government resources um, and less resources generally. And it's so important because when we have, uh, sometimes unaccompanied children are coming to join parents who are also in removal proceedings. And um, as many people can probably imagine, the trauma of seeing your own parent go through the stress of removal proceedings is a trauma all on its own, which is only compounded by a child who is also in deportation proceedings. And so, um, you know, really stepping up to serve the entire family and to make sure that we are um, seeing the inherent value in assisting the, the parents of a child and the value of that to the child as well as the parent is really important. It's important for us to, you know, really um, bring to life the, the motto that so many of us since 2018 have been repeating and hashtagging, which is families belong together. Um, and so it is really important if we believe families belong together, we need to make sure that we are providing services to the whole family and seeing the whole family as part of um, a new part of our community. And so, yes, one of the things that's so important is that, you know, whether it's funding coming without um, such restrictions that it only allows us to serve the child. Um, it's really important that we have um, funding and services and uh, support that's robust enough to allow us to serve the entire family because ultimately that's what's best for our communities and that's what's best for the children themselves. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, would anyone else like to weigh in before we hand it back to our host, Rosie Arroyo from California Community Foundation? I just want to say that Lindsay's message on making sure that that the entire household um, has the support it needs uh, has been heard. Um, we definitely prioritize that when families reach out to our office for support connecting to resources. And as city, county, and the, the Weingarten California Community Foundation look at a phase two of an immigrant uh, legal defense program. Um, we have definitely heard that message, the need for flexibility to respond to local needs um, and, and provide support um, to, to entire households. So thank you. Thank you so much. So with that, we'll... Um, extend a great thank you to you all for your incredible leadership in the LA region. And I'd like to hand it off to Rosie Arroyo from the California Community Foundation. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Aria, and thank you to all our panelists um, from this ex current panel, but also from the previous breakout sessions. Just, you know, really uh, touched and humbled by everyone's passion, voice, and leadership, and, and just commitment. And you know, um, you know that working in this field, um, you're working with people that have a lot of heart and a lot of passion, and that's what makes this work uh, just very unique. And I feel that just building on the conversations from yesterday and the opportunities, um, you know, as we look to to address the challenges that our communities are facing. Um, that it really is going to be with, um, you know, our heart, our love and coming together in this um, struggle to to really be able to maximize our collective um, efforts. So just on behalf of CCF, the Weingart Foundation, the USC Equity Research Institute team, 
um, and everyone that has contributed this um, you know, amazing program. I just want to say how grateful we are and really appreciate everyone's um, time to, to really join us for this um, conversation. I wanted to just take a moment to provide you all with you know, a summary of what we've been hearing um, you know, from building on the conversation yesterday um, and today, um, you know, yesterday was really the day that began to look at the impacts of the COVID-19, um, you know, pandemic and how immigrants are faring in Los Angeles County. Um, members share reflections on four years of negative anti-immigrant policies um, and also just ongoing challenges to fight and combat white supremacy and advancing racial justice in such a critical time in our history and nation. And today was really a, a day that was designed to, to build on the conversations from yesterday, begin to look at policy solutions and recommendations on what is needed for Los Angeles to successfully rebound from this pandemic and really build an equitable uh, and racially just region. A few themes that were uplifted in the breakout sessions um, are a few that we just wanted to highlight. And certainly there's there's more and we do, um, we have been actually taking also notes to capture the a summary of the key takeaways that we would love to also share with everyone. Um, and also share that if you were not able to participate in one of the sessions, um, we will be able to, um, uh, you know, recordings will be available in the social platform. Um, they are taking a little bit to download, so we just ask for your patience. But um, a couple things um, that were uplifted is that one, we need to see this moment and has, as a historic moment in time to reset that button and be intentional on how we define and how we question what an equitable recovery looks like. This is a political moment and window that we have. And in order for us to really seize these opportunities, we really have to think about and challenge ourselves when we think about what does equity really look like and how do we ensure that as we were building these efforts that we're really looking for community centered solutions from the ground up. We know that the communities that have been hardest hit are black communities of color, uh, immigrant workers, um, and communities. And um, we know that this pandemic not only exacerbated the systemic and structural inequities that have already been in existence, but it also brought on new challenges that we cannot ignore. Um, the other is that, you know, as we look to advance meaningful change um, and we look towards community centered solutions, we really have to look at how, what does meaningful structural policy change look like from the bottom up? For example, in education, um, there was a conversation about the need to uh, better integrate um, immigrant representation at the school board level. How are we expanding opportunities to ensure that parents have a voice in our local democracy, have a, a say in how dollars and resources are spent equitably and really address the needs that students are facing? Approaching this from a one educational system that meets the needs of everyone, the one size fits all model is not working. And so we really need to look for innovative solutions that will advance that meaningful change. Um, for the health panel, um, there was a lot of great conversation about the need to integrate community organizations into the healthcare delivery system and include organizations and communities into this decision making and, and health services. Um, we know that there is existing legislation um, like the Rescue Act and other types of aid that is needed, uh, but we also know that there is a strong need to continue to advocate for healthcare for all so that no one is turned away. Um, and really looking at more holistic uh, community-centered approaches that really look at the, the holistic needs that um, immigrant communities are facing from health to access to mental health and other critical resources. Um, in housing, uh, we see that um, as we're still figuring out um, data and getting more details about the impacts of COVID, it is clear that uh, renters are on the edge. Uh, the pandemic has increased homelessness. Um, and then we're gonna see Sadly, many more uh, people impacted, just as we're seeing that um, in the region, the um, eviction moratoria is coming to an end and um, renters are really being, uh, who are behind on the rent will be uh, facing some very serious economic challenges. And while there's still a lot of efforts that are happening at the city and county level, it's not enough given the scope of the problem. And we need to really address the root of these issues and um, really look for strategies um, that help communities um, really look for these long-term solutions and are not just band-aid solutions uh, from looking at how government could provide uh, buying rental debt, new zoning for community control housing, 
and in general, just really looking for bold um, ideas that really look to uh, address um, the challenges communities are facing. Um, for employment, um, there was a very also robust conversation about the need to uplift immigrant workers' rights, uh, change the conditions of labor, and change policy. You know, currently immigrant workers have um, every incentive, there's an incentive right now to keep immigrant workers from reporting labor violations. And so we talked about wage theft and other uh, critical challenges. And so as we look towards uh, forward-looking policy solutions that we really need to look for opportunities that also help to incentivize employers to create a new business model which centers their workers in order to change the industry standards and workers are industry experts and need to be included in business um, strategies. Um, there was also a need about talking about the need to take control of the narrative and describing what immigrant and black workers have faced during the pandemic to ensure that history doesn't forget um, and it doesn't get rewritten or obscured. And so there is this theme about um, remembering, not forgetting as we look towards um, building a more equitable and just society. And in general, you know, I would say that, you know, there is a need and, and, and there was a common theme about just the, the, the importance of cross um, intersectional work, uplifting collective efforts and communities really as we're seeing by all these discussions, do not operate in silos. And the families that we were just talking about um, in the they are children um, discussion are the families that are facing all these multiple challenges. And so for the organizations that are providing also representation to very vulnerable immigrants that don't have this safety net, don't have a lifeline of support, are the same families that are also dealing with the um, challenges and lack of access to affordable housing, lack of access to affordable health care or any health care, um, and meet and also challenges in education and so it's really an opportunity to see um, one is how do we really work together and how do we look for more holistic community centered solutions that really uplift community and um, you know address the root causes of these challenges and so to continue the conversation one of the things that we wanted to do for tomorrow is that um, as part of our closing uh, part of the program, we will have a, a three-part series of panel conversations that will be taking place. Uh, we're very excited about the, the um, uh, set of speakers we have confirmed. We have Council Member Kevin De Leon, um, you know, many other um, speakers, including um, LA County Board Supervisor Hilda Solis, uh, Supervisor Holly Mitchell, um, LA City Council President Nuri Martinez and Council Member Gil Cedillo, um, who are going to be also having a conversation and hearing from our policymakers about how do we move forward, how do we take these conversations, and and what does that look like from a you know regional perspective, and how are we going to ensure that we're um, really integrating, incorporating these policy solutions in a forward-looking agenda for the region. We're also going to be hearing from community leaders about current initiatives campaigns. Um, that are really helping to lay out the agenda to ensure that immigrants and their families are front and center um, in the LA's region's policies. And how do we do this in an intersectional manner so that uh, it really advances that meaningful racial justice um, lens and opportunities that have been uplifted throughout the panel. And then to, to close us, uh, we will also be um, having a panel that will close the summit uh, with an optimistic note um, and really talking about a very, you know, call to action about um, how, how do we make this happen? And so we're very excited uh, that we'll be joined by again, Manuel Pastor, uh, Cynthia, Cynthia Buiza from the California Immigrant Policy Center, Angelica Salas with Trilla, Nana Giampi with Black Alliance for Just Immigration, Baji, and Veronica Tariquez with UCLA. Um, so we're, we hope you can join us and continue the conversation tomorrow. Um, we want to thank you again for your time and just, you know, really look forward to continue the conversation and seeing where we take our efforts together. So thank you so much for joining us.